it's always a challenge to figure out how to introduce somebody as accomplished as Kay Warren. If I had to sum up uh, sort of her, her work and her life and her career, she's somebody who has really tirelessly dedicated herself to making a difference. Uh, she and her husband Rick are the founders of Saddleback Church in Orange County. And in that context, she probably is best known for launching the church's HIV and AIDS initiative, which has gone uh, internationally really to spread the word about HIV prevention, treatment, and dealing with those who are orphaned by HIV and AIDS. In Rwanda alone, the organization is responsible for more than 40,000 home visits to educate about HIV and AIDS, to reach out and provide badly needed social services. It, it really, she's made a tremendous difference in that and many other contexts. Uh, she's also somebody who has dedicated herself to using the, the lessons from her own life and the adversity that she herself has experienced to try to reach out to others and provide help. Uh, she is a, a two-time cancer survivor who has been very open in sharing her experiences and providing support to others. Um, I had the pleasure myself along with members of the Friends Board uh, to meet Kay and start a dialogue with her about six months ago on issues of mental health. Uh, she, uh, we, we met her just before the anniversary of the, the loss of her son from suicide one year earlier. And uh, as is characteristic of her, she has really worked through her pain and with her pain to reach out to others and has become a tireless advocate for mental health, uh, for providing better mental health services, to reaching out those to those who are affected, to the, supporting their families. Um, the conference that she and Rick sponsored through the church, Mental Health in the Church, uh, earlier this year attracted more than 2,500 participants to come and learn about mental health issues. And we are really uh, very, very grateful to her and honored that she accepted our invitation to come here today to talk about coping with suicide. I present to you Kay Warren. Good afternoon. I recognize this is not exactly your favorite lunchtime topic, so I apologize in advance for some of the parts that may be a little difficult to hear. I do appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and to share my story of mental illness, suicide, and the aftermath. Last year, my son, Matthew, became a statistic. He became one of the 39,000 men and women and children who take their lives in the United States. But Matthew is so much more than a statistic. And so part of what I want to tell you about is about my incredible son, Matthew David Warren. In the spring of 1985, I was in my second trimester of pregnancy with my third child. And other than extreme morning sickness, I was doing very well. I was standing ironing clothes in the days when we used to actually iron. And uh, I was ironing some clothes and noticed that my ankles were sort of painful, like, like a bite of some sort. And I reached down and saw these little red bumps, sort of like mosquito bites. They didn't itch, but they were sort of painful. As the afternoon went on, I realized that my ankle, ankles were moving from just sort of an ache to an actual pretty extreme pain. And by that evening, I found it difficult to even walk as my ankles grew more red as those bumps spread from mosquito size bite to actually quarter size and just by the hour were getting redder and um, I was in so much pain. So by the next morning I couldn't put any weight on my legs. And we went to the OB and he sent me right to a rheumatologist and by that afternoon less than 24 hours later as I limped into the rheumatologist's office he took one look at me, listened to what I was saying about feeling achy, these red bumps were feverish, I could barely walk, they were swollen. And he said, I suspect erythema nodosum. And uh, proceeded to tell me about this allergic reaction that could be precipitated by up to 62 different reasons. Probably would never know what the cause was, but this was almost certainly what I had. And when I left his office within that space of time, I could no longer walk. I left in a wheelchair, and I didn't walk again for three months. 
And during those three months of uh, being unable to even get up and use the bathroom, my husband jokingly says our marriage went from bliss to bedpans overnight, um, I worried about the baby. In those days, in 1985, ultrasounds were not routine, and so I didn't know if I was having a boy or a girl, but I knew that there was a baby growing, and I was very anxious that my illness could have some effect on this developing child in my womb. The doctors kept reassuring me that the baby would be fine, that I would be fine, but I kept thinking, how can they be so sure? Because I was so ill. When, he, when this baby was born on July 18, 1985, we named him Matthew, which means gift of God, and David is his middle name, which means beloved. And he instantly became our beloved gift of God. He was an easy baby. I was very grateful for that because my pregnancy had been so difficult and I had had to learn how to walk again after three months of total bed rest. And um, it was incredibly wonderful that he was an easy baby. But by about the age of one, his personality began to change. He began to hold his breath until he turned blue. If he was ever hurt or angry or upset, he would hold his breath and turn blue till he passed out. And I always had to remember to tell the babysitter that because they were always, if I forgot, there was an incredibly panicked babysitter there when I got home, sure that she had killed him. Um, he was sensitive. He became sensitive to light and sound and the way clothing felt. He was very irritable. He couldn't stand to lose. I, I, you typically teach a little child to play Candyland, shoots and ladders, some of those toddler games. He couldn't play them very well because if he ever lost, he became so enraged and angry. He would throw the game and um, couldn't really play with them and you couldn't dissuade him from that negative mood. It stayed for hours. He couldn't talk about it, but he just remained angry. He became very anxious and he clung to me if I wasn't around. If his clothes got wet, he, there was mayhem to pay until those clothes could be changed. He became aggressive. I was so afraid that when he went to preschool at age four that he would be the first one in the history of the school that was asked to leave on the first day because his behavior was so bad. He enjoyed kindergarten. He loved playing with the toys. He's very bright, very active. Um, he required a lot of assistance to stay on track, but he did pretty well. He got in the car the first day of first grade, looked at me with a very angry look and said, what did they do with all the toys? He never did like school after that. Well, we were worried because we had two older children and we knew enough about parenting, knew enough about children, the way that they develop, that there was something different about this little guy. He didn't act like his brother and his sister, but we really didn't suspect that there was anything seriously wrong. But by the middle of second grade, he started coming home and telling me that he was sad. He was lethargic, he was apathetic, and we attributed it to the fact that we had just moved across town and he had left the neighborhood that he had grown up in, and we just felt like this sadness must be because he was missing his little buddy from across town. But his mood didn't improve, it got worse. He didn't want to play at home, he didn't want to play at school, he didn't smile very much. And one day, in my absolute not knowing what to do, but knowing something was really wrong with him, I sat him down on my lap and I said, Buddy, can you tell me what makes you sad? What are some of the things that make you sad? Because all he kept saying was, I'm sad. And so I said, can you tell me what, it, what are some of the things that make you sad, make you feel sad? And he listed three things. And for the life of me, all these years later, I can only remember two of them. And I think it was because the second one was so traumatic. But the first one, he said, you know, Mom, what makes me sad are broken toys. You know, I think about how kids break their toys when there have been these people who worked so hard to manufacture this toy that they think a child is going to like. And then the child is just careless with their toy, and the toy breaks. And I feel so sad for the people who made those toys. And I feel so sad for the toys. I did not know what to do with that. And I said... Well, buddy, that, that's, that's sad. Can you tell me anything else that makes you sad? And then he said, Mama, it's so sad that people kill their babies. And, I, and he proceeded to describe to me what a DNC procedure is. And I was so glad that he was turned away from me. I was holding him with his back towards me in the semi-darkness because I did not know what to do. That was nothing that had ever been discussed in our home ever in the slightest way and to know that he knew details about something so 
profoundly difficult for a child to understand. Um, I didn't know what to do. And I think the shock of that wiped out my memory of what the third, even more upsetting, sad thing to him was. And all I knew to do in that moment was to hold my little seven-year-old boy and say, buddy, those are some big sadnesses. Do you think maybe you can just let mom and dad carry those big sadnesses? Those, those aren't sadnesses for little boys. You just need to play and have fun and just be a little boy. And daddy and I'll carry those big, heavy sadnesses for you. At that point, I had no idea that children could be clinically depressed. The pediatrician had already talked to us about ADHD medication, and he started it. At eight, he had his first panic attack. We started therapy. By 11, we started seeing a pediatric neurologist who diagnosed him as having early onset bipolar disorder. He and I were running through the house one day, just laughing, tickling, playing, being completely silly, and running through our two-story house just hilariously, having a great time. And all of a sudden, I couldn't find him. And I started looking through the house, and he was nowhere to be found. And it got frightening because I could not find him, and he didn't respond to me calling his name. Finally, I yanked open the closet in his room and found him huddled in the dark in his closet. And his words to me were, Mom, I just want to die. That's when I called his doctor and I said, tell me what's wrong with my son. ADHD, panic disorder, depression, there's got to be something else. And that's when he said, I've just come back from a conference on early onset bipolar in children, and I feel sure this is what it is. He had a sleep disorder, which interfered with his school progress. And although he was really bright, school became very difficult. And then in high school, OCD entered the picture. So his life was a steady routine of doctor visits, therapy, fistfuls of drug, IEPs, changing schools, adapting this, adapting that. At one point, he accidentally saw on a piece of paper that I had hidden from him, but he saw it in his classroom, that labeled him SED, severely emotionally disturbed. And from that moment on, he saw himself as a freak of nature, abnormal, different, outside the circle of other people, of other kids, and shame became a deeply rooted part of his psyche, leading to a very powerful self-loathing and self-hatred. At 12, on Mother's Day, when he was 12 years old, I was saying goodnight to him, just went into his room, just tucked him into bed, give him a kiss goodnight. It had been a hard day. And in the darkness, he said to me, Mom, would you just kill me and put me out of my misery, please? And I managed somehow to just say, buddy, that's, that's really sad. I'm so sorry that you hurt like that. We'll, we'll talk about this more tomorrow. And I walked out of his room and into the arms of his older brother, who happened to be standing outside his room, and I collapsed. Mothers should not hear that from their children, and to hear it on Mother's Day was particularly difficult. But that was the beginning of suicidal ideation that I'm aware of, and it waxed and waned through all his adolescence and into early adulthood. In spite of his increasingly tormented life, Matthew was a sweet guy. He was very sweet, very loving, compassionate, tender-hearted. I, I think that his own pain sensitized him to the pain of others. He could walk into a room, sense whoever it was that was also feeling alone, who was feeling sad, who was feeling left out, and Matthew made a beeline for the people in that room. It didn't matter if they were a child or an adolescent or an adult. He had a way of being in tune with others in pain and he demonstrated compassion. He was a great writer of short stories, artistic, hilariously funny. Nothing is as funny anymore without Matthew. He was just hilarious. He was the prototype for Calvin and Calvin and Hobbes, if any of you read that. He was a boy too smart for his own good, with a slightly skewed view of life and a very rich imagination. And over the years, it was his true self that we did our best to unveil to the world and to him. This person with enormous potential locked inside a body with a brain that didn't work properly. We did all that we knew to do. We read every book. We combed the internet. We looked for the best doctors, we, the best therapies, the best care. We had the financial means to go anywhere in the world to seek help for him. And we began to, to fight this losing battle when he turned 18 and was no longer under our control. And the medication that had been his religious activity every day, if you will, though that medicine box that went with him and that I was rabid about him taking all that medication. He decided that he didn't like it and he didn't, wasn't going to take it anymore. And so from then on, there was just periods of taking medication, periods of not. Periods of relative calm and success with periods of dark, wild depression and despair. 
and then a new psychiatrist. He moved on from the pediatric neurologist he'd seen for so many years. This new psychiatrist, as an adult psychiatrist, told him that he wasn't bipolar, took him off all of his medications, began to titrate him off of those. And within weeks of being completely off of them, he began to seriously talk about taking his life and doing it in a public way. And hopelessness began to settle in. He lost a lot of weight off the medication, as you all know would happen, and he liked the way his body looked, and he began to work out and remade his body into that that any man would envy. But the self-loathing and the chronic sense of emptiness and the inability to sustain relationships or moods, the anger and attempts to take his life began to dominate. And after one of his numerous hospitalizations, of which he said, this doesn't help, Mom. It only makes it worse. I pulled an old book off of my loaded bookshelf and began to read about borderline personality disorder. And I remember I sat down on the floor weeping, knowing that I had perhaps discovered a missing piece, why he didn't get better with massive amounts of medication and therapy and hospitalizations. When I asked his psychiatrist, who had been seeing him for three years, why he had never diagnosed him with BPD, he said, he didn't fit the profile. He's male, and he grew up in a stable home. And I was horrified, absolutely horrified, that a psychiatrist at a leading hospital in California was working off of old data, and my son had missed getting appropriate treatment for years and years, perhaps decades. I felt better. I was hopeful that finally we had a diagnosis, a better one, one that actually fit his symptoms. But he wasn't impressed at all. His response to me was, really, mom? How many times can you tell me this is the right doctor? This is the right treatment. This is the right medication. This is the right approach. How many times can you tell me that only to disappoint me? I don't believe in any of it anymore. Nothing can help me. Or if it could, it would take forever and I can't live like this anymore. It would be like trying to climb Mount Everest with a teaspoon. The last five years of Matthew's life were excruciatingly difficult for him. He was off medication. This drumbeat towards self-destruction got louder with each passing year, and he became obsessed with obtaining a gun so that he could shoot himself, even though he was terrified of being around the kind of people who could provide him a gun. He was afraid of pain and physical suffering, so many of the typical ways of killing oneself were frightening to him, even though he was picked up one time at a railroad track waiting for a train. He had a suicide buddy who was going to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge with him on Christmas Day. He tried so hard to build an, ex an exit bag. He didn't want to die a violent death. He wanted to be out of his pain, but he didn't want to die violently. So he tried to build an exit bag. He tried to buy Nimbutal from someone in Turkey he actually purchased liquid nicotine off the internet and tried to take his life with this supposedly painless poison 10 days before his final attempt on April 5th, 2013. But it was the acquisition, finally, of an illegal weapon that was a game changer. Now, he had almost a guaranteed lethal means that promised to him a quick and painless relief from the unbearable suffering that had robbed him of his hopes and dreams. And last year on April 5th, as I was in a texting conversation with him, he had had no intention of dying that day. Of all the other times he tried to take his life, of all the other days he got up saying, today I'm going to die, that was not that day. The irony. He had an actually a good day. He told his trainer that he was going to be back tomorrow. He was going to keep working on these biceps, you know. They, were, they needed to be bigger. He told his best friend that, you know, I can't say that everything's great, but things are better. He had a date. Three days later, he had another girl that worked at Chronic Tacos and he was going to go find her that night after his and talk to her. I have the record conversation of him talking to the girl he was going to have a date with and it was so excited. He had a, an appointment. He was going to make an appointment with his therapist that he had just found and loved, who happens to be Dr. Kissel. So he didn't intend to die that day. There were other days, but it wasn't that day. He left our home after we fixed him dinner, hugged, said goodbye, walked him to his car, and within 45 minutes he was texting me saying, I have a gun to my head. And in an impulsive moment, 
with a lethal means available, he took his life. And in the aftermath of his death, the shock, the trauma, the horror, the crushing grief, there were moments, and there still are, when it's been hard to take the next breath. Moments in which I have said, I am ruined forever. Even though we had lived with the threat of his death for more than a decade, we never gave up hope. We never stopped believing that somehow, some way, there would be an answer, that relief would come. There would be a therapy or a medication or treatment or breakthrough of some type that would come and allow our beautiful son to live a somewhat normal life. So when he died, we were beyond devastated and wondered if we could survive his loss. Soon after Matthew passed away, I ran across a quote that has become one that I repeat to myself every day since. It's from Eric Little, 1924 Scottish Olympic gold medal winner in the 400 meter race. Eric Little said this, circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans, but God is not helpless among the ruins. God's love is still working. He comes in and he takes the calamity and uses it victoriously, working out his wonderful plan of love. That phrase resonates very deeply within me, that God is not helpless among the ruins. And if I had to give you the reasons why we are surviving and even beginning to thrive in small ways, it would have to start, end, and conclude with my strong faith. I seriously cannot imagine how anyone gets through catastrophic loss, suicide, murder, without a very deeply rooted faith, and not just faith in a nebulous, unnamed force, but in God. I realize this is not a religious conference, and I'm not trying to persuade anyone to believe as I do. But if I leave out the impact that my faith is having on my resilience and my ability to keep living with joy, I would leave out the most valuable and helpful and comforting part of my story. Before Matthew died, a friend gave me a marble box with the word hope. I thought it was interesting that Dr. Lesser talked about a hope kit. I didn't ever hear of a hope kit. But a friend gave to me this box that says hope. And I began to put in it verses and, and words of encouragement and prayers, things that other people said to me as we prayed for Matthew, as we begged for him to be healed. And I read through the contents of that box nearly every day for the last three years. I created a playlist of songs on my phone. How did we ever live without iPhones? I created a playlist of songs on my phone that I listened to over and over and over and over again. They were songs that gave me encouragement, songs that gave me hope, songs that gave me the ability to believe that Matthew, that we would find an answer to Matthew's struggles. And they kept me steady even as he declined. But then he died. And this box with hope written on it seemed to mock me. And my playlist of songs seemed completely stupid and pointless. I thought maybe I would never recover and I wasn't even really sure I wanted to. But the alternative was to give up living, to stay in my bed, to neglect my husband, my surviving children, my precious five grandchildren, my work as an HIV AIDS advocate. And then I read that quote, and yes, my life seemed ruined beyond repair. But that phrase, God is not helpless among the ruins, stirred me to hope again. You know, I have unanswered questions, and I'm not going to pretend otherwise. I don't know why I couldn't save him. I don't know why I couldn't talk him off the ledge that night, like I had done hundreds of other times. I don't know why I couldn't find the answers for him. I don't know why the mental health community failed him in some very significant ways that I won't go into. There were others who were great, but the mental health community failed him in so many ways. I wonder, did he think of us as he left? I don't know the answers to any of those questions. I cannot tie up our story in a neat little package with a beautiful bow on the top. But what I've done is I've put all of my questions that I have no answers for. I know it sounds silly, but I'm very visual. I put it in this little pot. Those of you who cook might recognize the Le Creuset brand. It's, you know, it's, it, Le Creuset means the crucible. Well, the crucible was what we walked through when we lost our son. And all the years of torment that he lived through was a fire. It was a crucible. 
And I have put my questions to these unanswerable, these unanswerable questions inside this pot because I think about them all the time. My confidence is that knowing someday all those questions will be answered. I do believe that God is still working his plan of love in my life, in my family's life, and in the lives of others who hear about Matthew. The Bible talks about how God rebuilds the ruins, how he is a repairer of what is broken. And I firmly believe that April 5th was not the end of Matthew's story. And that all his body, although his body was ruined by a shotgun blast, he is still alive in God's presence. And his life story has meaning. And it holds out hope for others who are crushed by depression and mental illness. I've connected with several of the people that met Matthew on Suicide Project. How many of you know what Suicide Project is? Oh my goodness. You don't know what Suicide Project is. You must know what Suicide Project is. Go look at it tonight. It is a website for people who are struggling on the edge of suicide. And it says that it's a place for people who are they're not supposed to share means. They're not supposed to share methods of suicide. It's just supposed to be a place where they have an opportunity to share their deepest hurts and anguish. But I want to tell you that is a desperate place. Suicide Project is a desperate place. And it has people on it day in and day out. And Matthew was one of the ones on it who shared not only their stories, but they shared means. He found out some of the means about an exit bag and about how to buy Nimbutal from Turkey and all those things on Suicide Project. Your patients are on Suicide Project and you need to be there as well. But I have met some of the people that Matthew talked to on Suicide Project. Once they heard that he had died, several of them contacted us through circuitous ways. But here's the hopeful part. One of them is a middle-aged woman who has struggled for a very long time with suicidal ideation. But her, when she heard Matthew's death, and she connected with me, and she walked with me through the pain of his death and the sorrow that it had left us with, the way that it was such a crushing grief. She has decided that suicide is no longer an option for her. It is off the table as a way to deal with her chronic pain. I love that. Another is a girl of about 23. She was the one who was going to be his suicide buddy. She was the one who lived on the East Coast and they were going to meet in Golden Gate in San Francisco and they were going to jump on Christmas Day of 2012 off that bridge together. Unfortunately for him and his plan, her family hospitalized her and that plan was interrupted. But when I got Matthew's phone back from the police after they took his phone after his death and I got his phone back, I saw a text from this girl. I didn't know her last name. I just knew her name because he had told me about her. And I texted her back and told her that he had passed away. And she was devastated. And we chatted a couple of times because she was very ill. And one day, after not hearing from her in a couple of weeks, I just called her, middle of the day. She was standing on a train bridge in Tennessee with poison in her pocket. And I talked with her for three hours. And she left the bridge without taking the poison. I tried to connect her with people I knew in the area, but she didn't respond, and I didn't know what happened to her. Christmas Day, 2013. Our first Christmas without Matthew. She texted me to tell me that my call to her that day had precipitated her getting the help that she needed. And through a set of serious, a series of circumstances, her words, I'm healed. I know I just said the word healed, and in severe mental illness, that's not a word we use very often. But I can tell you that I talked to her last week, and she's not the same person. And she told me that she will be forever grateful for Matthew and his compassion for her suffering, and that if she hadn't known him, she wouldn't have met me. And it was actually through our conversation that she has found health and healing. And now she is using her life as a source of hope for others who find life more than they can bear. She has gone back to Suicide Project. And I warned her, I said, be careful, that is a very seductive voice. That voice of despair is a very seductive voice. She said, I know. I'm only going on for a little bit because I feel that there are people there I can help. And last week when I talked to her, she had found two other people who were now listening to her story of hope. And perhaps the cycle of life-giving 
continues. And so, for me, Matthew's story hasn't ended. The ruins of his shattered life are actually coming to life and bringing hope to others in ways that he could never have imagined. We are in the middle of a major home construction project, and I had no idea what I was getting into. No idea. I just thought they'd knock a few things down, you know, blah, 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 blah. I had no idea what I was getting into. And the first day I went into my home after the week of demolition, my mouth hung open because my beautiful home where I'd lived for 22 years, my little tract home in the middle of Mission Viejo was in shreds. They had taken it down to the foundation. And there was this machine, this little machine in the middle of my living room. It was a Saturday, so no one was there. But here was a little machine that was being used to punch the holes in our walls. And there was debris, there were boards, there was plaster, there was, there was insulation, there was dust, there was filth. It was this trash. My home was wrecked. The windows were all knocked out. And as I looked at this little destructive machine that was in the middle of my house, I thought, what a metaphor for my life. What a metaphor for my life. Because the agent of ruining, of destruction, if you will, both for himself and for our family, was our baby, our son. Right in, our, in the middle of our family, the agent of destruction, non to his, it's not his fault, but what brought ruining to himself and us was my boy. And yet as I looked over this little machine still with a wall in its grasp, outside the windows that had been taken down, I could see a beautiful blue sky, clouds. I could hear birds singing. I mean, it was this quintessential picture of hope. There were flowers blooming. There were trees that were green. And I thought, again, it's a metaphor. Yes, there has been ruination. There has been destruction. There has been absolute chaos in the middle of our family, in the middle of our lives. But even in the middle of that, even as there is in my home, there's still beauty in life. There's still beauty in this world. And so what I believe is that even though there can be ruination in our lives, that mental illness creates such tragedy. You know this. You know this. Mental illness creates chaos. It creates conflict. It creates broken relationships. It creates havoc. It leads to violence. It leads to despair. It leads to people giving up on life. You know this. But what I would say is that we're not left in ruins. So I get up in the mornings. I reaffirm every morning what I know to be true. God is not helpless today in my ruins. When I got up this morning, God is not helpless in my ruins. I was coming to talk to you about the most devastating loss the worst day of my life has already happened. But even so, I can tell you that God is not helpless in these ruins. And with his help, I will walk alongside others in deep pain, caring for them as whole beings. Please remember to care for people as whole beings. We are a body and a mind and a spirit. We're not just bodies. And I'll work to direct people to the best medical care that I know of. I'll encourage them to take care of themselves good nutrition and sleep and exercise, but I'll also encourage them to nurture the tender roots of faith in their spirit. I've chosen to use my platform and my voice for those living with mental illness, particularly those living with BPD, major depression, and suicidal ideation, and to be a part of the conversation to prevent suicide, to advocate for more research dollars, and to equip communities of faith, which is where I have my strongest voice, to become embracing, accepting, safe places for all who live with mental illness. It's not work that I would have chosen for myself, but I will do it in honor and memory of my beloved gift of God, Matthew David Warren. There is a little time. Thank you. Thank you. That's kind. I think there's a little time for Q and A. Is there that correct? Is. I can do it if you can. You can ask me anything or nothing. <laughs> I'll I'll start with with one question. Okay, first, thank you for sharing your story. It's 
I know it's not easy to tell, it's not easy to hear. Um, just about your family. Um, I, I know this was an un indescribable experience for you and Rick. Um, Matthew's siblings, how, how did they react? How did they cope? It's a good question. Matthew has an older brother and an older sister. And um, his sister lives with a chronic illness and has three young children. So for her, um, grieving the loss of her baby brother um, has had to happen in between daily life of taking care of herself and her kids. Um, her Matthew's brother, who's four years older, um, I would say the first six months, he was just angry. Matthew had, in his worst moments, terrorized the family. Um, there was, you know, because of the, the people that you treat, that sometimes people who live a severe mental illness have a way of becoming the hub of which the whole family revolves around. And in one sense, that's good, because the weakest among us should be placed in the center for protection and for care. But at the same time, it, it influenced everything that we did. And my kids speak to me now of, of the times I would say, Mom, you know, every holiday, we didn't know if you were going to be with us. Your body was with us. But we didn't know if you were going to be with us or if you were going to be wondering if Matthew was going to show up. And if he did show up, how was he going to respond? And so they have resentment of the ways that mental illness affected our family through the years. And I think my, my, son, my uh, middle son really responded to that after Matthew died because the thing that he had feared the most, his whole life of happening to his brother, had happened. And so he could actually kind of let down a little of his guard. And when he let down a little of his guard, some of the emotions that he had contained and didn't know what to do with through all those years were free finally to be expressed. And so... His first response for a long time was mostly anger. He was angry, just angry. He didn't know what else to feel but angry. And then um, sometime into that first year, it's as though the anger softened into the softer sides of sadness and grief. And, um, and he's actually had a very difficult time negotiating um, his brother's death. And yet, we are a very strong family. We have strong ties. and. Um, I know that we're each taking a step forward into our future uh, together. We have tried in our grief not to tell the other person, whether it was my children or my husband, how they should feel, how they should not feel, what they can feel, what they can't feel. We have allowed ourselves, we've intentionally uh, worked at allowing each other to feel whatever it is we feel or not feel in any given moment to express it and to just rally next to each other. I think we were talking last night at dinner that sometimes people have had the idea that if you lose someone or if you lose a child, then there's a very high rate of divorce. And from what I can understand, that's not necessarily true. It's not the, it's not the death that created the, the fracturing of the relationship. It's more likely that if the relationship had a lot of fractures already, that the stress and the pain of losing a child then becomes a catalyst that causes a relationship to disintegrate. So in our family, through all the years of the decisions that we had to make about Matthew, and my husband and I saw things so differently. We're very different people, and so all the years of Matthew's mental illness, my husband would think we should do this, and I would think we should do this, and then I would think that maybe we should add this, and he'd say, no, we need to subtract that. Well, we need to respond this way. So there was all this conflict that mental illness creates in families. And I worried sometimes that if Matthew were to take his life, that it would cause us, we were not going to divorce, but I worried that, that some of the intimacy and the closeness in our relationship might evaporate forever. And I can truthfully tell you, and I would say it's largely due to my husband's decision to fully enter into his own grief and pain and loss and enter into mine, that we are closer today than we have ever been before. Um, and I'm very grateful for that. There's nobody besides my husband who knows what it was like to lose our child. And for him, there's nobody that knows his pain as much as I do. And so we've very much been a team together. But that's a challenge for families. Um, and what do you do with, in the aftermath of, of uh, suicide? One other thing I would just say about suicide, and again, sometimes I feel like I'm telling you things you already know, but I'll just affirm to you as someone who's lost um, a child, that suicide creates layers of grief that other death does not. 
I've lost my dad, I've lost my father-in-law, I've lost my mother-in-law, I've lost my brother-in-law, all of those people dear to me. I nursed my father and my father-in-law through hospice. I, I know what it's like to be up close and personal in a dying process. But it was nothing like losing my son to suicide. They are light years away. And um, suicide brings layers of shame, of guilt, of recrimination, so many unanswered questions, um, stigma. It, so the grief that happens when you lose anyone you love is magnified by suicide. And to be able to talk to families and help them understand that that's normal, you're not weird, you're not strange for feeling this in different ways than other people feel it is, is part of the work of sharing with, um, with survivors. That's great. Thank you. Pat. Thank you for your courage in uh, sharing your story. You. Would you comment on the way uh, family members, friends, uh, uh, your social group responded, specifically ways that were most helpful and ways, even though maybe well-intentioned, were unhelpful or hurt hurtful? Such a great question. Thank you so much for asking that. I, I've concluded that people generally mean well. You know, people generally mean well, but frequently say the stupidest and the most unkind and the most help, unhelpful things. Um, what I have decided is the most helpful, non-offensive thing that you can say to someone who has lost someone is to just simply say, I'm so sorry for your loss. Because it doesn't say, well, they're better off where they are. I had people say, well, I'll tell you things that I heard people say. You know where his body was. Meaning sometimes people die and their bodies are you know, blown up in planes or lost and they never know. So that was supposed to comfort me that I knew where his body was. Some people said, well, at least he didn't hurt anybody else. I'm so grateful for that, but is that supposed to be the comfort for me right now? I had other people say, well, he's in a better place. Well, I absolutely believe that in my faith tradition he is. He is free from pain and suffering and I thank God for that. But that doesn't make my hurt any less right now. A friend of mine who lost her daughter, who a little girl was murdered a few years ago, within, she's a much younger woman and she could still have children. And one of the first things people said to her within a few months of her loss was, well, at least you can have other children. Anytime you start a phrase that's supposed to be comforting with the words at least, know that you are minimizing and you are hurting. You're minimizing the loss and you are gonna hurt the person you are speaking to because you are treating their grief as though it can be contained into this little tiny thing of, well, at least. At least you had him 27 years. Yes, I did, and I wanted him for the rest of his life. I didn't just want him for 27 years. So be careful of what you say of the at least, of telling people that they can get married again, they can have more children. Um, any of those things that are supposedly supposed to comfort, don't. As we got close to the one year mark, um, the first anniversary of his death, I, we had had this amazing cocoon of, of support, uh, just truly amazing. Um, so many people had enveloped us in, in care and support. But I started to watch that erode as it got closer to the one year mark. And on one sense, I wasn't upset by that because I don't expect my friends to remember every, the fifth of every month that that was the anniversary of his death. I don't expect that. But what I didn't expect was that people would start to hint either um, overtly or subtly that I should start moving on. That, that, that one year was coming up and, and I should be moving on and I should be going through it and that I should be rounding the corner and that if I didn't, that somehow I wasn't grieving well. That is absolute nonsense, absolute nonsense. And I was so fired up about it at that one year mark that I got onto Facebook, something I don't usually do, um, and I got onto Facebook and I wrote a rant and I just basically said, don't tell me to move on. Don't tell me to move on. I will move through this at my own pace, in my own way. And for those of you who think that you're helping somebody by telling them that, leave them alone. <laughs> Bug, quit bugging them. Be empathetic. Tell them you're sorry for their loss. Tell them that you're still praying. Well, I put that on Facebook and overnight, I guess it was in two days, it, it had been shared, Joy, my talent right, three million times. Where's Joy? Is that three million? Okay. So within two days, that had been shared three million times, and I had 10,000 comments, and it was an unintended study of grief. I never intended to study grief, but the comments that came back in those 10,000 comments were the stories that I'm telling you, that people would say, I lost my mother, I lost my father, I lost my son, not all to suicide, 
but all were suffering loss and grief. And they were told by people either the same things I was, or you need to stop feeling this, or you need to pray more, which is just the dumbest thing of all. And um, as though that praying is a wonderful comfort, but it doesn't make you not hurt. And um, so I heard from 10,000 people who said, I have experienced what you have experienced of people telling me to move on and to stop feeling what I feel. And why won't people just let us feel the ache and the grief in our souls? I mean, in our country, we used to have, there were cultural expressions of grief. People wore black armbands. You had a year of mourning. You wore back black clothes. It, there, was, there was a culturally approved way of going through grief in the United States. That's all been obliterated. And I'm not saying that we should go back to wearing black armbands, but let me tell you something. In a room even this size, if you were to say what is really truly going on in your life and the losses that you or someone you love has experienced, many of us would be wearing black armbands. They're unseen armbands of grief. And to, to tell people in our culture that grieving should be stopped at, at our predetermined time frame is, is such a wound upon wound to those who are already grieving. So be careful what you say. You cannot go wrong, I don't think, in saying, I'm so sorry for your loss. To express empathy, to express sorrow at someone's loss, you can't go wrong with that. Drop the at least. Don't tell them to get over it. Don't tell them that there's a time frame, that grief has no expiration date. And, um, and to walk beside them. The people who have helped us the most are the people who have let our grief become their grief. And I don't expect that of everybody. I don't. But there have been a few people who have let our grief be their grief. And they are the ones who have helped the most. That's the best way you can help a friend. Is to let their grief wound you the way that it's wounded them. Sorry, that was a really long answer. I do get a little passionate about this. What do you think... Um we as mental health providers should be doing differently? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, you have a specific area or as it relates to suicide, as it relates to the suicidal patient, be compassionate. I heard Dr. Lester talk about that today, establishing. Matthew talked to so many people who really, maybe they cared. Maybe they were tired. Maybe they were burned out themselves. Maybe they had talked to their 15th person that day and had nothing left to give to him. But the people that he, that helped him in all those years of therapy were the few people who related to him with compassion, who validated his suffering. The people that talk to you that are feeling suicidal, they are in agony. They are in torment. And to be able to validate, to validate, validate their suffering, to tell them that you hear it, that you feel it, that you care. I know that you all have to be careful about not becoming overly involved. I hear that. But that tiny spark of human kindness, of compassion, goes so far for a person who is feeling very unattached, unconnected, disconnected from the human race sometimes. All of humanity. Matthew would talk sometimes that he felt it was him against the entire world, meaning there was not another human being on the face of the earth. That he stood outside of them. Well, when you feel that disconnected and that unattached, to have somebody make that bond with you is a powerful healing, even if it doesn't keep them from taking their lives. Matthew was such a study in contrast because he was attached in a very strongly loving family and told people he was. But it just wasn't enough. There were other things that needed to happen that didn't happen, like the right diagnosis. Um, but even if it doesn't prevent someone from taking their lives, if in that moment you have established that bond of one human being to another human being, that there's somebody on the face of the earth who gets you, even if it's just a momentary experience, has to be one of those pebbles on the side of life is good. Life is good. And I can keep going on, even if it's just for another hour. It's my unprofessional point of view. Yeah, be compassionate. Um, I loved what they were talking about uh, because I feel like Matthew was misdiagnosed many times that um, 
that you're so careful. Okay, I'm not a professional, so you can feel free to strike this comment. Um, but I, I do believe that BPD is under-recognized, under-diagnosed, under-treated. We've got so few avenues for good treatment in the United States. Europe is ahead of us. Um, and so to keep going for research dollars for better treatment modalities for BPD, it's my soapbox. Going to go for it. Thank you for asking that question. That says to me, you're a good therapist. Uh, wait for the microphone, please. Um, thank you. I was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about any struggles you had um, over this last, you know, year and a half regarding um, stigma, uh, you know, in your community of faith or mm -hmm. broad, more broadly than that. Yeah, great, great question. We were, have been incredibly blessed because we have not personally experienced a lot of stigma. We have been just inundated with love and compassion. It's not completely true. I did get, um, there were a few people after Matthew died who told us, I guess I blocked it out of my mind because it was, it was so soon after he died and I didn't really want to think about it. But there were a few people that on the internet who took the opportunity to say that Matthew was probably gay and that that's probably why he took his life and that if, he is, if his dad hadn't been Rick Warren, he would be alive. So people did say some really cruel things. Um, I could say I didn't have any evidence that Matthew was gay, but if he had, I'd have loved him to the moon and back. It made no difference. Um, we had somebody who wrote to us who said, um, if, you had, <laughs> if you had homeschooled Matthew, if you had fed him organic food, this is all one email, if you had fed him organic food, if you had supervised every date he ever went on, if you had never let him pick up a video game, if, you, if your husband had truly lived a purpose-driven life, um, if you had been better people, Matthew would be alive. Now, my first thought was horror, like, are you... Are you kidding me? How could you say such a thing to us? And then I just started laughing because it was just so ludicrous. It, what do you say to something like that? So we did receive, you know, um, some, some terrible and some cruel things that were said to us. But as I have talked to hundreds, if not thousands of people in this last, these last 19 months, survivors of suicide loss, um, they tell me, they will say, I still have to whisper. Or, you know, my, my father died 15 years ago, and we still can't say why he died. Uh, we won't tell anybody. So people are still, especially I think in small towns, in smaller towns, in more rural areas, um, it is, they typically experience a little more stigma because it's still shameful. It's not something that you talk about. Um, that's why we're trying with communities of faith, all communities of faith, to encourage them to, to make mental illness a topic of conversation. There was a survey that was released um, about six weeks ago about some evangelical churches in America, and 66% of them said they never talked about mental illness. You know, 66% of the pastors said they never talked about mental illness. Um, well, how can we dispel stigma if we never talk about mental illness? And uh, so we want to encourage communities of faith to talk about it, to um, have people stand in front of congregations and say, I am living with bipolar, I'm living with BPD, I'm living with schizophrenia, I'm living with anxiety, I'm living with major depression, whatever, so that people can see these are, it's just, we're just all alike. We're all just people. And it's not a group. So to dispel stigma, we think communities of faith can, can lead the way in maybe ways that they haven't. And we're, we're working to encourage them to do that. Sorry, way in the back. You'll tell me when, when I'm running over, right? Okay. I'm sorry, who had the... Y'all are making me walk a long distance. <laughs> that way you'll work off your lunch. <laughs> Even had, had dessert yet. Could you please just comment on the relationship between parents of the adult mentally ill and the mental health system as it currently is fashioned? Oh, man. The, the relationship between parents and um, the, the, an adult child with mental illness is part of the, the brokenness. It, it's such a dance, and I don't have a good answer, but I will tell you it's a conversation that we have to keep having. Um, there were some of the therapists and doctors that we work with that, that would talk to us and some who would not. 
and there would be people who would be treating Matthew really erroneously because they didn't have all the facts. Either he didn't remember them about himself or he told it through his own viewpoint. And um, so it definitely affected the treatment that he got at various points. Um, and there were times when he was feeling good about his relationship with us and he would grant permission. And then there were times when he was mad at us. Maybe we'd hospitalized him and, and he didn't want us talking to the doctors. So it would go either way. It is one of the most difficult aspects to navigate is to have an adult child who is mentally ill. And where there's not a good answer is there is the autonomy of the self that we have. There, is, there are the rights to privacy, but those two are the two things that actually get in the way of mentally ill people often getting the help that they need. That's the, that's the, the ridiculousness of it is that these are people who need privacy, but it's the privacy and the shutting the people who know them best out that often keep them from getting the help that they need. I don't have a great answer. I don't know that anybody does, but um, we have to keep finding ways to, to work around that. Um, I liked, I think it was Dr. Lesser who also said that breaking that patient confidentiality at some points was necessary for the well-being of the patient, and that must be a very difficult decision for you all to have to make in those situations. Oh dear, I'm gonna cry. You were really That's okay, I've already so cried. Brave. You can cry too. <laughs> so brave and I appreciate it. Isn't enough, at least when parents are dealing with a child who's now an adult and saying, No, the child the child says no, the therapist can't talk to the parents. What about the therapist saying to the grown child, I won't say anything, but I will listen. I listen to anyone. I won't break your confidentiality. Is that, do you think, at least a piece of what would help? That feels like that's in an area I don't, I don't know how to answer since I'm not a would it have, professional. No, I mean, would it have helped Oh, if they you? had listened to me, yeah, not spoken to me, but listened, yes, that would have helped. It yeah. would have helped. Yeah, yeah. because... And I have had a few that would approach it exactly that way. That they couldn't speak to me. I had one psychiatrist who allowed me to email him, and I was able to tell him what I needed to tell him, but he didn't respond back. He would just write back, I got it. You know, uh -huh. But he, he did not, he didn't say anything back to me. But at least, you but he at least you let me heard. give input, yeah. yeah. There have been a few that have been done that. Okay. Yeah. Yes. You shared your story beautifully, thank you. I was wondering if you thought that when your son was beginning teenage, whatever, he'd already, you already knew what the problem was, if peer groups might have been helpful where he could have shared his story and his feelings with others in his age group that could identify and not make him feel so alone? Yeah, peer groups are, are I think, beneficial. He, he, he hated groups. It was one of the things that when he was ever hospitalized, he would just, when he had, when he'd made this whole list, if you're ever interested in all his list of things that are wrong with psych wards, I'll tell you, according to Matthew. Um, but one of them was he hated groups, just hated it, because he was put with people at every hospital, and he's been hospitalized in four or five different Southern California hospitals. And so I can speak from those four or five hospitals. And every one of them had group participation. But he was lumped with other people that he wasn't like. He was depressed. So in one of the places that he was hospitalized, when he, was, when he came in on a 5150, he was placed in a small locked unit where there were people urinating on the floor, screaming at doorknobs, um, beating, trying to beat the nurses. And he would just say, I don't belong here. I'm depressed. I don't belong here. And so for him to have to be in places like that, he, no wonder he didn't feel like he belonged or wanted. If he could have been with people like himself, that was his, he said, can't I just be with other depressed people who want to take their lives? Do I have to be with people who are psychotic? And not that, that I mean, they can't help it, but the point was it, it was not, it didn't fit his particular need. And so he just distrusted groups because of the fact that he was put with people, always, who were not like himself. I understand. And on an outpatient ba basis, but he wouldn't go. As I was just was thinking that if it was selective, adult. if it was a group of peers, well, from that what wasn't I can in a see, hospital people situation. with BPD are not generally encouraged to 
be in groups together. And so we never could find one in Orange County. It would have been, I thought it would have been great. I would have thought it would have been very helpful. But he was totally resistant by that point to that. Did that answer what you were asking, sort of? Yeah. I don't know if there's. Thank you. In, in, in my own faith tradition, faith and courage are considered uh, the same. And your faith and courage are a great inspiration. Please forgive me if this sounds like a trespass. Ignore it if it is. After all this, what do you think BPD is? I'm sorry, I can't see your, your yeah, I get, there we go. What do, you, what do you think BPD is? What do I think BPD is? Yeah. Hmm. Why are you asking that? Because I don't know. <laughs> I'm a psychiatrist with 30 years experience. And I've heard a lot of different things about it. I wonder if it's just an illness. Just an illness? That's it. Not a mental illness with the quotation marks that might imply, but just an illness. I wonder if you think that. Not a professional. What I have learned about BPD is that there are, there are biological reasons we were talking about that. Dr. Kissel was talking about that this morning with the amygdala and the limbic system and all different sorts that they're finding. So that is a, an illness, if you will. But doesn't that, can't you, can't you also, okay, I'm not going to go there. Um, no, well, what I was going to say was, but well, it's just because I'm not a professional, so I'm, I don't want to jump into territory that doesn't belong to me. Um, can't you say that about a lot of mental illness? So, I mean, if I wouldn't pick BPD out of all the other illnesses. Um, that seems to be sort of the ongoing conversation um, is what is mental illness and how do you pinpoint it and where does it come from? And so if you want to look at it in a broad spectrum, I would say what is mental illness is really the question. Okay, I, I, I'm going to take my prerogative and ask one last question. Yes. Uh, you're not a mental health professional, but you are an enormously successful social advocate. I mean, you've taken on mental health advocacy, you've taken on advocacy for HIV and AIDS. Uh, you, you've taken on causes that are stigmatized where the, the care is enormously under-resourced. And I think we, we've heard throughout the conference and, and from your own experience from uh, Ira's talk, how uh, the mental health system is just not adequately resourced to deal with people in crisis who have these kind of chronic issues. From your perspective, as, as mental health professionals, what could we do to be more effective advocates for getting better resources to provide care, getting a better social safety net, uh, combating stigma, the, the kinds of things that you yourself mm -hmm. were just talking about? Well, obviously advocating for more research speaks to the gentleman's question, um, is necessary. But I'll tell you what we have felt like we could put our, that the faith community can walk alongside the mental health community in ways maybe that hasn't happened up to this point. If I, if I had more time, I could, I could give you a whole message on what I think are the unique roles of the faith community in mental health care. Because unfortunately there will never be enough professionals. There will never be. Right now there aren't, as you know, not enough psychiatrists. There aren't enough psych There just aren't enough trained mental health professionals. And I don't know that there ever will be. But just in case there isn't, where is the failsafe? Where is a, where is, what, what is, can be an umbrella that can come alongside? And I happen to believe the faith community can fill some of that gap. For instance, at our church, we have trained um, 350 what we would call lay counselors. These are people who've taken 30 weeks of three hour a week training, plus they're interviewed, and they now perform about 50,000 hours of free counseling at, at our church. Um, we have support groups. We are um, looking to have what we call uh, mental health guides 
training people in our church who can walk alongside people who are mentally ill, who don't know how to navigate the system, who don't know how to navigate Medicare, who don't know how to get into treatment places, but that they've got a guide, somebody who is a volunteer, so it doesn't cost any money, but they're going to walk alongside with them to access what every county or city offers. Um, we, I really believe that there is that the, we can together with what the mental health community is already doing. And thank you for all that you have done. Thank you. You represent some of the best. The fact that you're here learning to me says that you are some of the best and the brightest because leaders never stop learning. So you are therefore leaders in your field. Uh, you're looking to learn. The, the questions that you're asking display your compassionate people. So to me, you are the best. And I thank you that for what you represent in, in the mental health field. But the faith community, and I'm talking about Christians, I'm talking about Judaism, I'm talking about Islam, I'm talking about every part of the faith communities can play a part in providing what lay people can do that would augment the fact that there will never be enough professionals. We can take it upon ourselves to help provide treatment for people, funds, treatment funds. Um, we're, gonna, we're establishing a scholarship fund so that people in our church who still, maybe they have Medicare, maybe they don't, maybe they have insurance, maybe they don't, but that becomes a barrier to treatment. Where do they go? They've tapped all the resources of their family. Families get burned out pretty quickly over the years. So if a faith community can have a scholarship fund that says we will help augment your treatment. It's such a small thing, but it helps then helps you in the mental health community access the people who need help because now they can get the help that they need, and yet we can play a part. We can be partners together um, in ways that perhaps many haven't thought of before. So um, I would urge you, if you're part of any faith community, go back and talk to them about um, finding a way that your, your church, your synagogue, your mosque can be a part of um, talking about mental health and what you can do um, for people who are living with mental illness. Okay, thank you so much for sharing your story with us.